Today, we are in conversation with Phil Harvey. He is an autonomous systems architect at Microsoft and author of the book Data, A Guide to Humans. We touch on a few interesting topics. What is data? What is empathy? What's the difference between biological and cognitive empathy? And why does that matter to us? But also, how should organizations be thinking about empathy? And how can we use art to talk about data? Phil was a speaker at the previous Conversation Design Festival, and he will be joining us for the next edition on November 30th as well. I very much enjoyed this conversation with Phil, and I know you will too. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Thank, thank you, you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. We, uh, I think we talked about this before, and then you were a big hit at Conversation Design Festival. And it's like, let's, do, let's spend some more time together. So, um, for, for people that don't know who Phil Harvey is. Can you give a bit of an intro there as who you are and, and what's what's your story? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so as you say, I'm Phil Harvey and I currently work for Microsoft Research as an autonomous systems architect in the autonomous systems team, which is uh, super fun AI work. Um, I work on something called Bonsai, which is a simulation based deep reinforcement learning platform. So kind of cutting edge AI um, for autonomous systems, which is super fun. But my background uh, before that, um, I'm kind of a, a strange person because I have a degree in artificial intelligence. It's a Bachelor of Arts in artificial intelligence from the turn of the millennium. So that both shows how old I am and how weird my education has been. So it's an arts degree in AI. So that was fun, sort of philosophy, psychology, programming, anthropology, linguistics, all that kind of stuff. Then since then, I've worked in architecture. I've worked in advertising. I've worked as a startup founder and CTO. And then I joined Microsoft to, to give up programming and to start focusing on people. And somewhere in the mix, I wrote a book. Yeah, you wrote a book called A Guide to Humans. I'm just going to show it here. You have it too. We both have a copy here. A Guide to Humans. So why why was it important for you to write this book with your background? And what were you seeing around you uh, that made you think, this is what I'm going to focus in, I guess, a lot of time on? I'm spending a lot of time on this. I think there's three three competing motivations in it. Um, the first one was this word empathy was thrown around a lot in technical fields, in startups, in it became fashionable for people to talk about empathy. And I realized that as a programmer, I didn't have a huge background in empathy and it didn't really make a lot of sense for me. So I started to research and look into what it meant for technical people. And actually the book came second. I was lecturing i did five years of lecturing at the same course on what i called you know uh data empathy as it were um so they were sort of the first two bits that i was kind of wrote some content on it to try and help people understand how empathy relates to technical work and then i met noelia my co-author who gave me a whole new perspective on um using these techniques of cognitive empathy which i found and researched and looked into about appreciating all kinds of other systems, you know, up to Earth system science and all of those pieces. So it was really kind of a, I wrote down the things that I'd learned um, <laughs> and other people then seemed to like them. So, you know, so that, that was good. That's definitely good. But you say a lot of people, like data or empathy was becoming, a, you know, like a trend almost. Everybody was talking about it. But I think where where was this happening? Because I think for a lot of people, this is still very early days where we start thinking about these things. So there were there are there are business books. So Satya Nadella wrote in a, a book about empathy being important. Harvard Business Review had a little book for business people on empathy. There's a was a book that was released by Roman Krasnick just called Empathy. And then Paul Bloom wrote a book called Against Empathy. And um, people 
from, for example, the the tech Buddhist community, which is a weird sort of subset of sort of spiritualism and technology, starts to talk about radical compassion and you know disliking empathy and all this stuff. And I realized this word was being thrown around. People were saying, "Have you read this book?" And this is important, and this is bad. So I started to research it as a kind of um, as a topic to work out why people seem so fascinated you know in my in my network and in my circles and at the events and why it was creeping into my life as a programmer that that makes sense and then you decided you learned all of that and it became more important and more interesting that you maybe initially even thought yourself and then you were like ready to share the story yeah so that what I, what i realized is that a lot of people who talked about it didn't really know anything about how complex empathy is as a term behind the scenes and actually the when you look at the full spectrum from biology and people who there are people researching empathy in plants and you know that stretches all the way from people who sing to plants to make them um, grow better all the way through to sort of mycelial networks in uh, forests and you know systems understanding systems and people would use this word as basically a stick to hit people with, to go, you need to have more empathy because mm. you make people sad. Um, misunderstanding that people are on the, you know, the autistic spectrum, different people have different social skills and technology and different ways of approaching the world. And so it, it became fascinating to me. And I started to see a lot of the problems in technology related to uh, very specific kinds of uh gaps in empathy yeah because i hear the I've, I've heard people talk about the plant stuff and more mm -hmm. and more that there's these systems in nature that look after you can you can you share a bit more about that because that's i've never jumped into it so i don't know much about this and i guess i'm not the only one <laughs> So there's, um, let's describe the split first. So in empathy, you can think about the difference between uh, emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. Emotional empathy links very closely to the biological side of things. People study certain things about how the brain works. There are lots of people very fond of their brain science. There are scientists who looked in animals and animal societies from monkeys and apes to dogs and cats. And people have extended that all the way through to uh, plants and plant systems. Then on the other side, you have cognitive empathy, which we'll come back to. But on the biological side, um, I, I read that you have these things called mirror neurons, which fire to give you an, a sense of emotion when you see an emotion in somebody else. Emotional empathy is if you're sad, I'm sad. And this is the kind of empathy that Paul Bloom's book is against, because the manipulation of people's emotion through the trigger points that they have, have what's known as a spotlight effect. So socially, empathy leads you to focus on things. So advertising that puts a, a, um, a child in distress on the, sea, on, on the screen in front of you is doing that to trigger certain social responses, which are very tightly linked to your uh, biological empathy. And so in the plant kingdom, people are, are studying how far that goes because um, systems, if we, uh, I'll use that word kind of, explicitly on on purpose mm -hmm. systems that process information about the world have models of other systems in their world so you can look at one of my favorite examples is that there is a bee flower system the flower reflects light such that things like bees and flies can find its nectar there is some understanding of the system there. It's not mm. conscious and rational, but it's built into the natural system that there is an under, there is an understanding and something being shared there. Does that make any ton of sense at all? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Systems relate to each other, have empathy for each other to help each other. But in humans, that form of empathy can also be manipulated, which is then the scary side of it. Yes. And this is exactly. biological empathy. And then we have cognitive empathy on the other side of the spectrum. Exactly. So the um, the biological empathy leads to emotional empathy that can be manipulated, just as you said. Cognitive empathy is a rational act. If you think about um, emotional empathy being sharing the needs and feelings of others, 
cognitive empathy is understanding the needs and feelings of others. And uh, it turns out, and there is research to support this, that if you practice your cognitive empathy, if you practice the rational act of understanding, mm-hmm. it helps develop your natural empathic capabilities to to read other people and to to interact in social situations. So in data, we can use our cognitive empathy skills that we can practice to work out what's happening as these systems around us and the people around us interact. That makes sense. And then when we talk about data, if because we're getting philosophical here yeah. uh, in a way as well, what 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 is what's data? I guess that's a very simple and maybe even a very complex question. There. Yeah, I, I like it as a question because, hey, data is the thing you buy when you buy a mobile phone plan, right? <laughs> they sell you <laughs> some data every month. That's the data that you get. But in in the book, I sort of go into and we we explore the kind of first principles of what data is. And that's kind of detailed kind of in points. But I think what I want to draw out of that in this case is data is the evidence of systems communicating. That's what's really important. It's it's captured some kind of evidence, even if it's a sensor capturing change, somebody's designed that uh, to capture that interaction in the system, interaction, communication, however you want to phrase it. So data is the capturing, the captured stuff that happened in that system in the past. So if if we, does that also apply to the biology side? For if we have the flower and the bees and the interaction, so we see something happening in nature, that would that also then be regarded as data as a result? <laughs> of that interaction? So if it is not, to be sort of brutal about it, if it's not written down, then no. So we can talk about uh, differentiating the book between data, information, knowledge, and action in these kind of places. Data is this specific asset that we have when it's written down. Um, you can think about books as as data because somebody wrote it down. Mm. The the plant and the bee, they don't write anything down between them. We have to add sensors into that space to capture specific things about that. So we have to take measurements, as it were, to capture to, uh, that happening. Yeah. So it is a derivative of the actual interaction itself then. Yeah. And so then we have that. And then uh, you talk about epistemology. Uh, a lot and and the change of of data and what I like how you wrote that down because I studied Foucault in in university and and did a paper on that so that's why epistemic Mm -hmm. ruptures were always uh, an interest to me Uh, and you describe it very well is that we currently have these systems that generate data but then that data also becomes the input for more systems so data generates itself and then creates more data. At, and I yes. guess that's also when you get into the singularity world uh, that people like to talk about. Yes. But uh, what, what's what's uh, epistemology and, and why is that relevant? So, epistemology is the study of what you know and how you know it. So it's the philosophical area where you're just looking at, at knowledge and systems of knowledge. And the way I like to think about data and um, stepping one step before an idea of the singularity in that way, in those pieces, um, is that data is a change to the human epistemology. It changes what we can know and how we can know it. And you can track back through time these big changes in the way that we know things. So you can talk about, and I'll be really broad brush about this, things like the internet changed how we knew things. Social media changed how we knew things. Data changed how we knew things. And stepping before that, the printing press changed how things could be known. It it changed the literacy landscape of people and the control of information and data as it was shared. You can look at the... um, uh, the enlightenment and the, the the scientific methodology is a change in how we knew things. You can look at people's attitudes towards religion and global religion and wide religion as opposed to local religion in each of these pieces. Each of these is a change in how people deal with knowledge, how they deal with uh, gathering new things to know. And so fast forwarding all the way to to data and then artificial intelligence after that, we're changing how we know things. And that's 
that's important because as soon as we change how we know things, we change what we can know and we change the way that we generate knowledge as a society, which is a core part of what it means to be the information processing systems that we are as humans. That's that's a very wonderful explanation. Thank you for that. I remember when uh, my professor, he's, I don't remember what the, the guy's name was, but he, he, he writes also about in Rome, just before the Renaissance. So Middle Ages, people are just waiting for the world to end. Uh, they're just like, you know, that's what we call the Dark Ages, just waiting for the world to end and that's it. And then in Rome, a scholar sees that in the painting world, like the students get better than the master. And that creates like this first notion of growth, which was like a mm -hmm. whole new concept of what the world was and what people's role could be. And that there was a room to growth and that kicked off then the whole renaissance. And I just love that story of, of, and I guess how you explain it now, that makes total sense. It's like, how do we know things? And that influences the way we see mm -hmm. the world and therefore also defines us who we are as people. Yes. And um that defining who we are as people kind of comes comes to the fore as the core important thing in this because then we see so to get even more philosophical if you consider i called us as humans information processing systems all systems that uh exist as subsets of the universe they take in energy and information, and they output energy and information, right? And when we start to process information in this way, and systems start to, to optimize, then we start to see the optimization loop changing that system. So let me give you an example in energy. Humans used to struggle to find food, which is the way we take energy into our body. We've optimized gathering food to such an extent that it's making us unhealthy. So if you think about if you ate fast food all the time, you'd become unhealthy and you'd die mm. because the optimization in that case is becoming destruction. We've taken it past the point of survival, but we've continued optimizing. Yeah. So if you think about information in the same way, we're changing the way that we take information into our system and we're optimizing it. And we've just passed the point in the last five, 10 years, where we've started to make ourselves unhealthy with the way that we're processing information, because we're over optimizing that exchange, we're making it too easy to gather new bits of information in a way that gives us dopamine in, in this way. So we become, and excuse the way this sounds, but we become fat and lazy. And we stop struggling for things. And that struggle is where our health is based. Our bodies and our minds are based on having to work for things. Mm -hmm. You take on this amount of sugar to go and hunt for more sugar and protein in that way. You take, you learn this amount of stuff, this amount of information to go out and find more information. If it becomes too easy, you destroy yourself. Is that what's happening at Facebook? <laughs> I wouldn't possibly name any names, <laughs> but social media as a whole has created a very fast information dopamine loop for people. Yes. And uh, we've overindulged ourselves in data. And is that yes. when we talk, when, you know, when do you feel, what do you hope people get from the book and the work that you're doing? And I, I think you maybe just answered it, but what's, what's the mission behind the book when we talk about empathy and data and around that? So the, the, the mission is to give people a new perspective on empathy as applied to technical work because you can be more successful in technical work by practicing skills in cognitive empathy so whether you're a programmer a data analyst somebody who works with technical people any of those things cognitive empathy is something you can actively practice and if you actively practice you'll create more positive interdependence with the people around you and you will be more successful you'll communicate better you'll produce better results you'll produce better metrics all of these different pieces. So the first thing was to, to write down those things that I saw about around success. The secondary goal is to give people a way of um, thinking about systems in a rational way. I, I talk about systems and systems thinking and systems theory quite a lot in sort of everything that I do. And I think that's 
important because then when you look at earth system science and you look at our impact on the environment and you look at the, the way we interact with other people all of these things all the way up to the the universe itself is a system that you can understand if you start to break it down in different ways so if you start to look at data to understand things in a particular way if you start to um, open yourself up and and fundamentally I say the word listen because it's the easiest to hear, but it's about awareness of systems. Yeah. See systems everywhere and, and, and learn to listen. But it also sounds almost like you're putting people on a path to enlightenment because if you don't perceive with all the you know, sensors that people have and understanding that they're all, because I like that idea because there's so much matter around us that we can't even perceive, but we're trained to just see what's relevant to us, but there is more beyond us. So we're already putting a filter an algorithm on the input that we're receiving just to have it make sense to us. But actually we need to be aware of that filter in a, in a way. And if we create that understanding and have emp uh, kind of have empathy for that process, I guess we're also reaching higher goals when it comes to humanity in and of itself. Yeah. So that, um, the word enlightenment is dangerous because <laughs> it puts us on a whole different path there, but the when we're looking at the human impact on each other and on the planet and you know what the future of humanity is positive interdependence is better than um purely transactional isolationism and transactional isolationism is the one path that we could be on where i only communicate with people because of what it gets me as opposed to being open to other people's needs and feelings makes sense and um, so we talk about data in general now about you know what it means and empathy in general when you know there's lots of fields that are involved with data we are or, or i am particularly interested in conversational ai and the data that streams through these conversational systems when you because we talk about empathy a lot and, and creating human-centered design experience or human-centric mm. experiences do you feel like conversational ai how do you how do you benchmark that to other ai industries maybe or is, is that a silly question maybe altogether no no it, it's definitely not a silly question but i think the the way that you ask that is, is really nice because i know a lot of people when they think of ai conversational ai may seem like a surface technology you know an interface and, and these kind of things but actually the it asks some really fundamental and interesting questions about the nature of technology in our lives. And I'll use that analogy of transactional versus interactional in, in that way. So on the one hand, conversational AI is about bringing computer interfaces into the realm of language. We're talking about sentences, not buttons, you know, and uh, we're talking about helping computers to understand how people express themselves in a conversational flow instead of from a button click or you know loading a url or doing some uh, writing a bit of code or the, those kind of things but this gives us an interesting problem when we're looking at data because language data is not like click interaction data because mm. language fundamentally as a communication tool doesn't carry meaning language causes meaning in another mind or another system so purely statistical models of language have a fundamental philosophical flaw when it comes to what can be understood from them and i think this is a, a challenge the ai industry as a whole has to get over and conversational ai all, all the way back to Turing has been one of the ways that we start to push that boundary, you know, from the Turing test, which was based around conversation and, and fooling people with conversation. We now have to continue to see how that communication is changing because a lot of conversational AIs that people will meet are not very good. And you end up in a kind of frustrating transaction with them. Mm -hmm. And um, your work is about helping people to get past that and to create things of value and that are to create meaningful interactions. But it's still based around language. 
And if you use purely statistical models of language, you will, there will be issues. So we need to start talking and conversational AI will push this conversation into a better model-based understanding of that interaction and that mind. So com the, the technology behind conversational AI needs to take in that that communication from somebody and start to model their paradigm, start to model who they are, because then it will communicate back in a different manner. And so that is the conversational AI having empathy for the person who is trying to communicate. Yeah. And the the data sets that are available are a way of that system understanding more. So on the one hand, conversational AI has this massive problem and you see this played out with technologies like GPT-3 and those kind of pieces. On the other hand, it has the best chance of many of the technologies in this space of AI in actually doing something meaningful and, and useful to humanity. Well, th that's hopeful. Um, I think there, there's two things here that, uh, that cross my mind. There is a now a new wave where a lot of these NLU models are very much statistics based, uh, just machine learning. And now you sort of see a wave of more linguistic models that sort of see language as the output of behavior rather mm -hmm. than these are just, you know, throwing darts at a board. Did you mean that? Um, so, so that is an interesting thing there. And then I, I guess what you're saying is if we, we need to model the language more and have empathy in that. And we, we've always taught people like it's empathy is not about feelings necessarily. It's like when, so, when something goes wrong, you don't say, oh, I'm so sorry. But well, empathy actually comes from showing that you understand the situation, right? Oh, so you yes. lost your luggage and you're stuck in Singapore let me see if I can help you. And then you feel so understood by just repeating the words back to them. Um, but I guess like when you start mirroring the language and the vocabulary of individuals where it becomes very personalized and it becomes really the mirror of the person you're interacting with, then, you know, because language is so personal and so intimate for people, yeah. it's put so much like responsibility on designers and, and people in conversational AI to really understand what it means to now get so close, like it allows you to get so close to people that at the same time, I guess then it, it's also dangerous in a way. Yeah, it's the, it becomes dangerous for me when you cross that line into deception. And you see that in the very negative use of voice systems, you know, the ones that call up old people mm. and pretend to be what they're not and all that, you know, it's a terrible use of this technology. Um, and there are a lot of negative actors trying to manipulate people in all kinds of ways because it's powerful, because uh, a voice that is saying the right things to you connects with you on such a fundamental level. And so, it's it's about this is where the responsible AI conversation really starts and ends for me. So there's a huge loop around here. But if you're treating people authentically, if you're working with people authentically and they have an authentic relationship with a system that is authentically trying to help them to use the same word many times, then that's okay. As soon as one side is not authentic, if the human is trying to manipulate the machine or the machine is setting out or has been given the goals of deceiving somebody, then you're going to have problems. And working out what is authentic and what is deception is a huge topic. People, It sounds simple when it's stated like that, but you know, a designer going road going, my goal is to sell more of these things. Let's push these people down this path with more emotive language that's manipulative but again that could be described as advertising yeah so based on the book and the work that you're doing you're going to be developing we're looking at developing a course then if you look at the world of, of conversational ai and the people that that work in this field like what are some of the key things that you would want to highlight for particularly this conversational ai industry I think the first one, and this is not conversation AI specific, but it's it's all technology, which is we need more structured technical approaches to listening. 
So structured technical approaches to being aware of other systems and other people in this way. And we need to break down the, the automatic way people talk about other people, emotions, you know, uh, emotional content or feelings or, you know, the word empathy used as a kind of stick to hit people with, or this wasn't a very emp empathetic conversation. Why not? Oh, it just didn't feel good. You know, the, these are conversations up here and you've got a structure, you need a structured method to work through to the core problem. <clears throat> you need a structured method to work through to the core problem, the core conflict, because what in, in the book, we take the model of cognitive empathy and the paradigmatic uh, empathy uh, model in itself and show how that relates to specific conflicts. So where you have, um, let's take a methodology gap, where the language around method and how things are done are at odds. So if you, if you think about it, it's like, um, uh, I don't know if you're, you enjoy cooking biscuits and cakes, but let's say you enjoy cooking biscuits and cakes and you can recognize the ingredients and you know to combine them, but you go to somebody else's kitchen and their cook is different the way that their oven works is different. There's a different method for applying heat to the ingredients. You have a conflict in methodology there. But if you don't break it down to understand that that's the problem, mm. solving that problem is so much harder. It's like, I don't like your kitchen, I can't make cakes here. It's very different from, please explain to me how to use your oven. Yeah, Very different ends of the spectrum. And that may sound like a straightforward example. It was kind of meant to. When we get into technology and somebody's designing conversational systems for a business, the CEO may come up to them and go, I hate that. I, I hate the system you've built. It doesn't feel right. What's the path from that to resolution of the conflict? Because it's usually something quite small. It's aesthetically wrong. It, it pushes, uh, it appears to push people down the, the moral path that the CEO doesn't like. Maybe it's a language problem. They're talking about users and not clients. You know, these small pieces, that's at the end of the journey, but you need a structured process to get there. And then the third bit is methods of practice. Practicing empathy is the most important thing. And that's not necessarily practicing with your clients one-to-one. -one. That is finding ways to practice that make you better with your clients. And my favorite example of this is... Um, making art functional in the practice of empathy. It's a really fun thing to do. So taking taking people to art galleries or looking at art or working these things out and work out how to talk about these pieces of art in the context of your work in a different context and a different paradigm. So that'd probably be the three main pieces that, that I think. Can you share a bit more about the last part? Like, is that something you, you've done with clients? Or is that... Yes. It's it's something when I'm talking through this work and explaining how to practice, I've had a funny history with art personally. It's now something um, I love and I find really interesting, but I was, you know, wasn't really into it for a long period of my life. And it was actually Schopenhauer who helped me understand that um, this, what Schopenhauer describes as the tragedy of the will where you know you feel bad this kind of existential crisis that people have he said that the three ways out of it were art music and compassion so all of those three things have become very big parts of my life and helped me interact with the world in a different and i hope better way when it comes to art art before it was art for art's sake was always a functional tool for understanding religious art takes people on a journey mm -hmm artists for communicating things everything from wealth to social status to messages to people who can't read all art is there to be used you can go and look at some art wherever it is and use it to help you and a great thing to do is to practice your empathy by looking at a piece of art and then working out how to explain how this applies to something you're dealing with in your business how you explain it to somebody else, explain it to a child, explain it to a musician, explain it to a programmer. And a great exercise that I love doing is showing people a piece of art and saying, how does this relate to data? And watching them go through that process of those creaky old boxes in their head filled with dust when they they open it up and they go, I've got to explain this thing 
and now I've got to use much more of my brain. And that is an exercise, that is a piece of practice you can do, which relates strongly to your cognitive empathy. That's brilliant. I, I like I'm also thinking about clients that we work with where like I don't see it happening. But I guess that's the challenge. Like this is not something this is now a like it's it's you know, if you have a ship and you steer it in you know, mm-hmm. in one degree, you're gonna end up at a whole different place, you know, at the end of the journey. And maybe it's here too. We're setting in a new course on empathy yeah. and creating that understanding. So there's um you did me the, the you gave me the privilege of speaking at the conversation design festival um and the audience was so kind and responded really well to to the content there and there was a group of people in the audience there who their comments told me they really understood something that I was, I was talking about here which is brilliant yes moving a ship talking to a client about something that can be hard the people who do that the people who try and make that change i think of them as bridges they need to step over between worlds and try and make that change happen so we're not necessarily trying to tell a client how to be different but we want to help people be bridges they need to identify when a bridge is needed they need to step into that role and enjoy it to use these empathy muscles that they develop to make that change. And it might be that they don't use art in that way. They just work out how to use the client's language back at them mm. and keep going and don't give up. You yeah. know, listen, listen to the client. Listen to the client. I feel, you know, I've, you know, I've shared this with you, like the new narrative that we're sort of working on is, you know, you always have these opposing perspectives in organizations or in the world in general, but what if we just don't treat it as who's right, but just assume that we're both equally right. And that forces us now to understand what the other person's thinking. And in our case... Exactly that. Yeah, it, It's that when you say we're both equally right, okay, what happens next? Yeah. Well, you've got to move, they've got to move, but somebody has to help these two right perspectives move together because you need that interdependence to work together. Uh, Anybody who's working with a company, with a team, with anybody else, you need to find those interdependencies, ways that you rely on each other, then you can move forward. And so I love that where you say, both right is okay. Now now we're looking for who moves. Do I move? Do you move? Do they move? How do we make that happen? Yeah. And cognitive empathy, I found in my career and my experience to be a really powerful way to do that because it teaches you to listen and to kind of accept your own movement as much as somebody else's. Yeah. So don't listen to respond, but listen to understand. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. And we're doing another conversation design festival on November 30th. Uh, you're going to be there again, right? Yes. If you'll have me. No, <laughs> I think we already agreed <laughs> on that. <laughs> no, is there a... You mean that you didn't think of that spontaneously now? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's always a strategy in play, Phil. You know that. <laughs> no, uh, thank you, thank you so much. We're getting to the end of our our time here, and I very much enjoyed this. Is there anything we touched on a lot of things? Is there anything that you feel I should have asked you, or something that you'd like to re-emphasize? Well, I mentioned music, and you didn't pick me up on that. We talked about art and empathy as a form of compassion, but music in the middle as well. Um, I don't think there are enough musicians in the world. I know that some people find that a strange statement, but anybody can make music and music is a wonderful other world that people should dive into. So anybody listening who's always wanted to, but hasn't go and find something to make music with. And on that note, thank you so much, Phil. It was great seeing you. Thank you. Hey there, you made it to the end. Congratulations. I really appreciate that. Uh, I know you're busy, so you've listened to a full episode. So congrats on you. Great job. So now what should we talk about? No, I'm just kidding. First of all, thanks. Second of all, if you want to learn more about Conversation Design Institute, I highly recommend that you go to the website, conversationdesigninstitute.com. Dot com. And there you can sign up for a free account and start your learning journey. So you can learn about you know AI training, conversation design, conversational copywriting. There's lots of technology courses. So now that you've gathered these technology agnostic skills, uh, what are you going to do next? You know, are you 
You're going to learn about Allen App, QBox, Raza, Cognigy. We have all these different technology courses as well. So there is a whole, whole portfolio. So I recommend you know going there, creating a free account, watching a few videos. If that's enough for you, great. Uh, if you want more, you can just enroll and become a certified professional. These courses are really good if you are you know an individual designer, writer that wants to learn about conversational AI. But if you're an enterprise and you're looking to skill up your team, uh, lots of enterprises onboard their entire team to these courses to scale them up quickly. And it's also an option to add extra workshops with that and extra coaching sessions. So you quickly get that enterprise team where you want it to be. If that's a little too much, maybe uh, there's also papers you can download on the website, maybe learn a bit about how we've helped Vodafone skill up 100 people in different countries, in different languages, using different technologies, creating the Toby chatbot in apps, on websites, in voice, all these types of things. So you can learn about that too. The best way to stay in touch, follow the podcast. You know, you'll, you'll hear all the latest updates. Uh, say hello on Twitter. H-V-D-A-M is my handle. Stands for Hans von Damme, obviously. Uh, or just type in my name on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I post regularly. I like to engage with people there. Uh, so feel free to do that. So again, thank you so much to for listening to this podcast. You know, happy to meet again for the next one. Mm-hmm.